Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. All right, welcome to Revolution. Um, it is, uh, is it February still? I think it is. President Day's, President Day weekend. You guys barbecuing today? Does anybody barbecue on President's weekend? Let me know if you can hear me okay. I've kind of put the, the phone back a little bit further than usual. Um, that tight shot, it's a little bit much sometimes. Um everybody a few minutes. I know you guys like to greet each other, welcome your neighbors, welcome each other to another exciting Galatians revolution. Ah, thank you, Angel. Good to see you. Angel, you are a, I've decided you are a citizen of the world, my friend. My friend Angel just commented on our Facebook and that guy is all over the world. Where in the world is Angel? Oh, so you guys, um, while we're waiting on this, I, and Kate reminded me, I'm going to be in Belfast. Um, I'm going to be in Belfast, speaking in Belfast. Uh, in, no, let's see, January, February, March, April, May. I believe it's in May at Wake, uh, which is Pete Rollins' event. And this will be the first year that I get to be in the the big boys club, the big girls club, the adults. I get to speak with the adults this year. Usually I'm on the fringe stage because I'm so punk rock. Um, but yeah, so be, I'll be speaking and, 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 and maybe doing some hosting as well, which I'm very excited about. I'm um, getting my, my uh, lounge performer act down for, for, the, uh, for the event. Um, We'll be talking about dangerous ideas. <laughs> um, it's a dangerous idea having me. <laughs> uh, uh, having me, me, me talk. Um, having me host anything. But yeah, so I'm going to be there. So I'm going to just plug Wake for a second because I'm going to say like, listen. I actually just met some friends who are going to Wake. who live here in the city. And... Um, because we felt, hey, got to meet before you go to Belfast. Why not meet here before we meet in Belfast? Um, but Belfast is an amazing city that's been through hell and back. Um, and the people there are amazing. Pete always puts together a first-rate event. Amazing speakers, um, obviously. Um, <laughs> and entertainment. Um, but also part of it is just the people who come is so, so diverse and so different and so unique. And, um, you know, I've been a few times and the last year I went was the last time they did it because of, you know, we haven't done it for years because of COVID and I don't think they're going to do it next year. So this is like your chance to go if you want to go. Um, just spending time with the community that comes out for that event. And it, it, it's like, you know, it's like church camp. You don't want to leave by the end, you know, because you make all these new friends and all from all over the world and everybody's in different places. And uh, it's really cool. So that's all I wanted to share is like, you know, check out Peter Rollins on Facebook or wherever and, and, and check out Wake if that's something you might be interested in. Um, or if you go to a, ch a church, you should have tell the church to send their pastors there because that's pretty good stuff. And, and this year is going to be very interesting because uh, one of the speakers is going to be talking about his how he lost his son to suicide, and um, and I think that's going to be really uh, a really tough but beautiful talk. So I'm really looking forward to this year at Wake. It's an incredible time. Um, it was very healing for me in a really dark time. So today we are going to Galatians 4, and here's the thing. 
about Galatians 4. You know what? Give me a second because I got a drink and I'm going to get my drink. So talk amongst each other. All right. Little, little coffee. Because I don't speak fast enough as it is. Um, oh, my jean jacket, you ask. Oh, yes. This jacket is a vintage Levi's jacket that was for the first wedding I ever did. It was for my, a bass player. My, I was in a, uh, a band, social distortion cover band called The Creeps. And our bass player asked me to do his wedding. And it was the first wedding I ever did. And it was pretty cool. And he paid me by giving me this vintage Levi's jacket that I've never worn until this week. I just was like, you know, I've been holding on to this thing forever. What was I going to do, sell it? It's got so many memories, so I finally decided to put it on and throw some pins on. It's big E. I guess that's important. All right, anyway, so here we are. Grab your Bibles. Turn to Galatians. So Galatians 4 for me, in the past, <clears throat> here's the confession. Galatians 4 has always been a bore to me. It's always been my least part, least favorite part of Galatians. Not to put that on you guys. Um, but I've realized this now it's not. It's, it's, it, it's, it's nice when you grow over time and see things differently. Um, I've also been studying some stuff on the... Um, on Christology just recently, and I think maybe that kind of got me just thinking differently. I'm not going to bring that into this necessarily, but, um, and, and uh, atonement theory, because I, I did an interview a few months ago, or maybe the month ago, and people were really pushing with me on the whole, whole uh, atonement theory thing. And, not, and what I realized was like, I don't believe in atonement theory, but I'm not sure what I really believe. And so uh, I was talking to Pete about it, and so I've been, he, he, he recommended some books, and, and I've been reading these different authors and these different folks about, about it, and it, it's been really exciting, and I can't wait to share some of the stuff that I've, because they were asking the same questions I was, which I was really uh, pleasantly surprised, and uh, really interesting to see. So I can't wait to share, share that with you all, but I think it's allowed me to, you know, as I read more philosophy and more philosophers and, and who are also dealing with theology at the same time, it allows your mind to kind of work in a different way. And I think that's why we should really, studying is important. And so for me, um, this kind of just, it kind of opened up a door for thinking differently for me. And so when I looked at this today, I saw something I hadn't seen before. And I think it's really interesting. And probably why I thought it was, you know, one of the reasons I was like, oh, you know, we'll just get through this because it talks about Abraham. And it's like, you know, I felt like he already made that point already. And now he's making it again. And, and now I kind of kind of get it. So it's pretty cool. So, yeah, let's let's dive dive into Galatians four. Um, now, we did a, uh, an overview last week, which I was pretty power out of, um, to be honest with you, of Galatians one through three. Um, even though my kiddos were here, but my kiddos were great, and they, they did, they're not here tonight today, but they were they did a great job. I don't know if I'm going to make a habit of that um, until I can get maybe someone to come over and 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 watch them. But it was it still worked out, um, you know. And we talked about the last part of four, which I really feel like the power is. I mean, I feel like all of one through three. I mean, all of one through three kind of build us up to that end of three of. Uh, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. I think that's a that's a big thing. And we talked about no low arc, no low archy or hierarchy, and, um, and 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 how we are being exposed to be humans, uh, very much in a way. And I will kind of mention this: is how how Christ is humanity is exposed on the cross. Um. So then we jump into four. So let's do that. And he goes, my point is this. Because he said, we're all offsprings of Abraham. That's how he ended Galatians 3. My point is this. Heirs of a long... Uh, heirs... My point is this. Heirs, as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves. Though they're owners of all the property. 
but they remain under guardian and trustee until the date set by the father. Um, you know, I, I, my friends who, whose father, they lost their father very young and, and they didn't get their inheritance until they were like, in their 20s. And, um, and, and so sometimes it happens. So you, you know, so a lawyer or someone has to watch over your, your stuff to keep you, you know, because, I mean, I think it's smart in some ways for parents to do that because you're like, you know, what's a 14-year-old going to, a 15 or 16-year or 17 or 18-year-old going to do with, you know, $100,000? I know what I would have done. <laughs> Spent it like that. Um, so with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elements, the elemental spirits of the world. And this is also talking about the law. And so the law is watching over us because we're enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. And I think in some ways he's also talking to the Gauls in this because that was a big part of their faith. Um, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children and become, because you are children of God, because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you, know, you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir to the th through God. Now, what's interesting about this idea is Paul is really playing with something dangerous here. And I, and I didn't see it. I've done this so many times. I've read Galatians. I've been reading Galatians for 26 years. I almost said 24 years because I thought I was younger than I was. Um, and I've probably been doing a yearly study of it for like five or six years now. Uh, a, a yearly talk on it. And before then, I probably actually did more talks. That's probably why I made it go yearly, so I would talk about it less. Um... And, and Paul's doing something cool here, and we're going to see it. We're going to really see it in a minute. Um, but one of the things that he's making clear is that we're all under God. And now, and now, so when he's saying, like, you were slaves, you know, you are no longer slaves, but child. And, so, and, and think about him saying this to, he's saying this to, to not just, like, the Gauls who, who, who were Gentiles, because that would have made, more, made sense. But he's also saying this to Jews who feel like, no, we were not born of the slave. We were born as the free. So, you know, we're going to look at how that kind of continues on in, in Paul's idea of really what, how we are all one in Christ and like, and how he really means it. And it's pretty, pretty insane um, theologically what he's doing here. I mean, it's really mind boggling. Um, so just follow me. So you're no longer a slave, but a child. And if that child, then also an heir through God. Eight, formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved to being that by natures that are not gods. So probably beings of nature, probably also talking straight to the Gauls at this point. Um, now, however, that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn your back again to the weak and beggarly elemental spirits? How can you want to be enslaved to them again? You are observe, observation of special days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid that all my work for you may have been wasted. He takes both the Gentiles and the Jews the Judaizers and the Gauls and puts them together and says you were to the elementary spirits and now you're doing certain holidays and he's almost blending the two religions together and saying, why would you go back to that? So I have to, now with this more insight in this, I have to believe that people were going like, the Jews are being like, Judaizers were like, let us just have our Jesus and our Messiah. You go back to your religions. And I have the feeling that there was a temptation for everybody to just return back you know, take all their toys and go home. 
It was either destroy each other or split apart. Go to war or split apart. Now, how is that not so much like what we live in today? I mean, just over something like the um, vac vaccinations, you know, or politics, those two things. They, we go, well, we're either going to go to war over it or we're just going to ignore each other and, and let them go there and we're going to go here and we're just going to live our lives separately, you know. And if you decide, either one of these groups decides to get on social media or go on a podcast or have a podcast or any of these things and talk about it, then we'll fight with each other, you know, for a while and then the news will change and then we'll go back to our corners. It's, it's like a boxing match, if you will. Um... And, and so I think Paul's gone to the point of saying like, I've had to confront people, I've had to do this, but now he's saying like, if you just continue to go back to your corners, if you refuse to see the humanity of one another, if you, just, if, if you feel like you have to have this hierarchy, lowarchy, I mean, hierarchy works in such deceiving ways. I mean, in a legal, it's like legalism. Legalism just always works in certain ways because legalism will creep into both groups hierarchy and lowarchy, you know, and then there'll be, still be the us and them because we'll have our own legalisms of, well, they don't belong and we'll know well, we really are the real people, so we don't belong. And Paul's going like, no, we do, you know, and he's saying like, if you guys continue to do this, you're throwing it away. Even if this group might be a little bit more right than this group or this group might be more a little correct than this group, you're still throwing it away and throwing away community. So... But, but, you know, it seems better for us to at least go and take our toys and go home than to be at war with each other, right? But I think what Paul is, is calling us to live in a community and to do the hard work, to do the work of loving our neighbors and loving our enemies. Um, I, this is what Paul is, is begging for these people. And you're going to see how close he is to these people through this, just this chapter. I don't know how this chapter just became alive to me today, but I'm really excited that it did um, for myself and for you guys. So he's saying, you know, because, he, you know, back here he goes, the, the weak, biggerly, elemental spirits, like other gods and, and things like that, and how can you want to be enslaved to them again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. And so then he goes right into Judaism as well. And he goes, all right, guys, you're both. And he goes, I feel like all my work was in vain. I mean, so yeah, this is once again um, a harsh letter. I mean, yeah, it's a harsh letter and it's the best letter written on grace. And we can learn so much about grace from Paul the Apostle. I wish more people would read Paul. I was talking to someone the other day um, and you could tell that they were just, you know, didn't want Paul. People are afraid of Paul. I mean, and, 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 you know, I was a part of this group called the Red Letter Christians. And in that, I think one of the things was missing was Paul. But I think the problem is that people don't understand Paul and don't want to take the time to study Paul. And then if you have to get into reactionary Paul, like me with the pastoral epistles, and you know what I believe about that if you've come to revolution at all, um, that they're forgeries. Um, I think with ill intent, to be honest with you. Um, but... We miss a deeper level of grace. We don't, it, it's like we just, we want to do surface thinking, you know? And I feel like I didn't understand who Christ was or what Christ was doing until I read Paul. And then I was able to go back and, and see Christ in so much of a, a different way, in so much of a deeper way, in deeper thinking. It's like when I read books, when I read Hegel, when I read Tillich, when I read even Zizek, when I read even, you know, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., I'm able to, to, to take my thinking and go into so much of a deeper way of, 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 of understanding and, and, and use critical thinking and, um, and be on a, not a surface level. And I, I, unfortunately, I think with religion and with Christianity has made the mistake is that it's been very surfacey and that a lot of people haven't been willing to deep dive into to understanding what it truly is and have missed um, the humanity of it and instead turned it into like magical thinking. Like, oh, well, we'll just focus on the miracles and we'll do healing things and we'll talk about this and the God. And, and, and they take out the humanity. 
And so for me, I, I'm saying like, let's, let's, let's stop magical thinking and let's find the humanity in the Bible. So uh, I feel like reading the book of Galatians, I'm also at the same time going like, I, I'm saying the same thing that Paul's saying. Like I'm trying to like say like, why am I commenting on this? Is because I'm saying the same thing that Paul's saying to, to people in this community, which you guys are doing a really great job of arguing well and having tough conversations. Um, but I'm going like, we have to, now, now I'm giving it to you for you to take into the community. And when I mean community, I don't just mean Christian community or just revolution community. I mean the world. Like, you know, if we're going to tell the good news, the good news isn't like, he is risen. Yes, indeed. You know, um, that's not the good news for me. The good news is, is that we can be human beings and we can argue well and we can live in, in a different way of society. And we can say this isn't how life is supposed to be. We don't have to kill each other. Um, we can do the hard work to make the world a different place. Uh, I, I, and when I say different and not better, because I think it would be better, but I think sometimes when you say better in this type of, of, of in a biblical sense or a Christian sense, people think like, oh, like, you know, oh, we're going to take over the world. You know, no, that's not, the, you know, and it's going to all be perfect and peaceful. Uh, you know, that, that's not reality. I mean, we're always, suffering will always be with us, much like the poor, the poor will always be with us. We'll always have struggles, um, but we can be there for each other. And this is, let's look at what Paul says to, to the Gauls, uh, to the Judaizers, to the people of Galatia about this. So he says, um, I'm afraid that my work for you may have been wasted. Friends, I beg you to become as I am, for I also became as you are. You have done me no wrong. You know that it was because of a physical infirmity that I first announced the gospel to you. So this community literally got built because Paul was sick. Some people believe he had eye issues and all, there are all sorts of different issues we could speculate on. But Paul was, had physical illness, um, much like most probably people had to deal with in these days. Um, and he was very sick and that's how he came to the Galatians and that's how he started the community of Galatians is because he came in very sick. That I first encouraged the, uh, and first announced the gospel to you. Though my condition put you to the test, so it must have been very bad illness, you did not scorn or despise me, but welcomed me as an angel of God and Christ Jesus. You know, so, so I, I think this is what, what's so interesting is he's trying to remind them of, of this deep, <sighs> this deep sense of gratitude of saying, like, you guys took care of me. You know, you showed me love when I was sick, when I was at my end. And that's how this community came about was because I was able to share, you, share with you my work and my reasons for my calling in, the, in that time of sickness, but you guys were also able to show me compassion and love. I mean, how, how awesome is it, you know, when you're sick? Like, I just remember, like, when I would be sick and go to my mom's house, even when I was older. Um, I remember this one time, um, my dad had just got out of prison, and we were all supposed to go to New York, and I got a stomach bug, a really bad stomach bug. So they all went to New York. Um, but Shirley, who, who, who was like a mom to me, and, and I lived with her for a year, but she, she came and stayed at the house with me, and I laid in my dad's bed and took my medicine, and I slept. And there was just something about like being in dad's bed, or like when I would go to my mom's house, my mom would like put me in her bed and bring me, you know, chicken soup, and you, know, and you just feel cared for and loved and, and safe, you know? Um, and, and I think about like Paul kind of expressing that feeling of like, you know, here I was on a journey, extremely ill, and you comforted me and you cared for me when I needed it. You know, it's like the Good Samaritan, right? And, and so he, 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 he's sharing, like reminding this community of how hospitable they were. And be, to be hospitable in this time was extremely important because without hospitable, <laughs> without being hospitable, hospitable, <laughs> um, you would die if a community didn't welcome you in. If you were sick, you were done. Not even if you were sick, if you were just hungry and thirsty, if you didn't, you know, when you were making these long journeys, you depended on the kindness of strangers 
to do your work. And obviously that seems to be something that we've lost um, these days. I think that's why I love Belfast so much. And probably one of the reasons Angel loves to travel the world all the time. I can never keep up with that guy. Um, because in other, there's other countries that seem to really have this. And, and like when I'm in, when I'm in uh, Belfast, it's just like, it's such a welcoming community. You know what I mean? It's like such a like, you know, they're so hospitable. They're so loving. They're so caring. It's like, you know, like I've become a member of Pete's family, you know? And to me, that's like crazy. You know, his, his, his mom, like, makes me shepherd pie and 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 you know and that's one of the reasons I love going there I mean honestly it's like it feels safe it feels warm it feels like like refuge but it also doesn't feel like refuge without the reality of suffering like everyone's been through it there and that's why they help take care of each other and I think that's what we we sometimes don't do here especially in the states is instead of taking our hurt in our pain and using it to to restore and help other people and, and empathize with other people sometimes we use it as a, a way to push people away and so we say things like trigger warnings and oh you shouldn't have said that that, that set me out and we become very self-concerned that we're not offended rather than worrying about how we love and, and show that to others um, now don't worry Paul's gonna get a little harsh here so for you, those who like the harshness, and we're about to get there. But he goes, you did not scorn me or despise me, but welcomed me as an angel of God or as Christ Jesus. What has become of this goodwill you felt? So, you know, basically he's saying like, now I feel scorned and despised. The way you guys are treating each other, what I hear that you're saying about me, what I hear what you're saying about your community and the gospel, what's happened? And we're about to get into some cool stuff. I'm excited today. Um, For I testify that I had been possible you would have torn out your own eyes and given them to me. So, so he's saying, like, I experienced a type of grace and a type of mercy that you guys showed me and gave to me as though, like, you would give me, like, your, take out your own eyes, give up your own sight so I could see. You know, you have something special as a community, you know? And what I love here is he's not talking about Judaizers or Gauls or anything like that. He's just saying, as a community... You all reached out to me and took care to me and heard what I said. Now, obviously, something's come in and, and, and stirred up trouble and lines have been drawn in the sand and it's become a very us and them situation and we're right, you're wrong. Um, I belong, you don't belong because I do this and you don't do that. And, you know, I got this and you don't have that, you know, that type of thing. Um, because, but you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? And I find that this is the hardest thing for people to take is sometimes the truth does hurt. And Paul is saying, you know, am I, so when he says there's neither male nor female nor Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free, when he says we're all one in Christ, when he says that works but don't matter, not the old Gaul works or not the old Judaizer works, but he says these don't matter anymore. Um, he's speaking a very harsh truth. When he's asking people to communicate well, he's speaking a hard truth. When he's saying that you guys can't virtue signal one another, he's speaking a very hard truth and people, they don't want to hear it. And he's like, I feel like I've become your enemy. And so obviously something's going on that's so strong that it continues to get back to Paul. I mean, obviously there's been horrible things said about Paul to the point where Paul felt like he had to prove himself as, a, as an apostle, defend himself, defend his message. Um, but you can also see the great love he has for these folks. 
And I've been doing this long enough to know what it's like to have people turn on you. I've had people who've left and gone to more conservative churches and come back and told me I was leading people to hell. Um, <laughs> I've had people get mad because I had to let them go and go around and spread gossip about me all over the neighborhood that I worked in. And, you know, one day you go to the tattoo parlor and you're like, why is everybody treating me like an asshole in here? You know? And then you find out, well, they heard something from one of your old employees and blah, blah, blah. You know, you're like, you know, what do I do? <laughs> um, and, it, and it's kind of like when, when watching my parents lose everything when I was a kid, you know? Um, you watch all these people who like wanted to be on the couch <laughs> when I mean the couch, wanted to be interviewed by my mom and dad and love. And now all of a sudden they turned on them or calling them everything but the, you know? So it was like their failures made them enemies. And Paul's saying, well, you know, now I'm just trying to speak the truth, but now I've become your enemy. I'll, I'll give you an example of something I did. Um, two, two examples. Uh, one, I remember talking to uh, someone very close to me saying like, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not sure about the, this was almost a year ago, but I said, I'm not sure about um, the vaccine. And I said, you know, I'm going to get it because I have kids and things, but it's also, it's like, it's the government, which uh, I've always had a hard time trusting and it's big pharma, you know, and all of a sudden everybody who's like cool is telling me I should get it. But at the same time, it's like these big organizations that I've had a hard time trusting most of my life and have hurt a lot of people and destroyed a lot of lives, but I'm supposed to be okay with this, you know, and I just needed to talk it out. That was it. And they go, oh, have you been red pilled? You know? And, and then the second one is I put something up the other day about the Democratic Party, which is the only party I've ever voted for in my whole life. Confession, okay? I've been a lifelong Democrat. Um, now I'm a disillusioned Democrat. But I put something on basically explaining my disillusionment with my own party of like kind of like these empty promises that have been made and, and aren't being met, like health care and... Uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act, and ch uh, ch ch child care not being passed, you know, all this different stuff. And not just Democrats, but Republicans as well. But some of the things that the Democrats have, have, have told us that they were going to, you know, there's supposed to be roses floating in the sky and they're not. Um, but just some, sharing some of my disillusionment there. And, uh, but it was only critiquing the Democrats, which I felt like, well, I have a right because I've been a part of that party my whole life. Um, and someone was like, you got to take that down, you know? And I did, I did take it down to be honest with you. Cause they're like, they're going to think you're this, you're going to think you're a conservative and they're going to think, you know? And I was like, you know, you can't even speak the truth or critique, uh, the group that you're a part of in some ways without having to worry about how everybody else is going to think about you, you know, and, and judge you. And I, even here, I've had a lot of you go like, well, what's going on here? You know, you, you, you seem to be hard, really harsh with the left. And I'm going like, yeah, that's because I'm part of the left. Matter of fact, I'm more left than most left. But I care about it. It's something I've been a part of. And I've realized like some of the horrible things that my party's done and some of the horrible things that, 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 that people who I voted for and, and put, you know, thought were really great did to other people and really hurt other people. You know, and so I feel like I have to critique it just as I would critique the right, you know. Um, you know, I feel like the right is a little bit more transparent with their, like, crappy stuff. And, and the left are like, oh, no. And then they do it. And then they just kind of, you know, and you go like, well, wait a second. It's, they're like doing like magicians. Like the left is like, oh, no, don't pay no attention. Look what the right's doing. Oh, we're going to do this over here, you know. And um, so... Speaking the truth can get you in trouble. Um, speaking your convictions can get you killed. It can hurt. And as you know, I've always said revolution isn't a safe place because I want this to be a community where we can speak truth, where we can, and that's why I want us to argue well, um, because the world's not a safe place. Pol politics aren't a safe place. Life is not a safe place. It's good to have safe places, you know, like if I wanted to drink, I know I could go to an AA meeting and go talk there and would be in a place that would be fairly safe. I would probably hear some hard truths, but I would be in a safe place. Um, and, you know, 
it's just not, you know, we're not going to uh, just pat. It's just not being in a place like, yes, yeah, pat each other. And why do you think so many churches and so many big organizations and so many governments have so many issues with these leaders who are so become so egotistical is because they're surrounded by people going like, oh no, you're right, buddy, you're right, you're right. You know, they just with yes people. And we're not called to do that. But you know, most of my life, I was a people pleaser. And I, I, did, I just wanted to stop conflict from happening in my personal life. Now, in my professional life, you guys know, I've always been stirring things up. And maybe that's been my only outlet for a long time. Um, but I've learned now to speak truth even when it doesn't tickle somebody's ears or when it doesn't make them happy and I do not, I, I, I will jump into conflict. And sometimes I have realized that I'm going back into people pleasing and I have to pull myself out in order to be true to who I am and to be a better friend to that person, you know, and, and, and hard, because hard truths sometimes make us better people. Most of the time do. And we learn from those experiences. Or it's a misunderstanding, and we learn that we misjudge each other. Um, and this is what I like that Paul says. So Paul says again, I'm going to read uh, uh, 4.13 one more time, or 4.18 one more time, or 16. I don't know. I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see the numbers very well. I mean, I do have my glasses on, but I need reading glasses. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? And then he says after this, he goes, they make much of you. He's talking about the leaders who are causing problems. But for no good purpose, they want to exclude you so that you may, may make much of them. They want to exclude you so you will make much of them. Like when I was a kid growing up in the church, probably post-parent scandal, but going to different churches, I often thought like if the pastor was better than me and I felt guilty and I felt like my life wasn't together and their life was together and how somehow I was, that, that, that they were saying the right thing and I was doing the wrong thing. Because they would exclude me because they'd say, well, if you're doing this, and I knew secretly I was doing that, or if you're doing that, and I know I'm probably doing that too. There was this exclusion, but they do the exclusion to tell them that sometimes we exclude others to put ourselves on a pedestal. And if you don't think we do that in the political system or in all these other systems, you know, it's crazy. That's why I was so interested in the whole, um, uh, uh, I thought it was interesting to take a look into um, that Joe Rogan thing um, and, and uh, the singer. Oh gosh, I can't remember his name now. Um, okay, who's saying keep on rocking in the free world? Um, somebody will tell me here in a second. Neil Young. I thought it was interesting because Neil Young was like, I'm doing it. And he was like, Neil Young's like up here. And everybody's like, yeah, and Neil Young. Everybody's downloading Neil Young's music and all this stuff. And it's really like, okay, yeah, that's, that's what we're going to do. And then I look into what, like where Neil Young sold his music to. And where most of the, half the money of the people were going and going like, yeah, we're going to support him down to Spotify. You know, Spotify's got a lot of shitty issues. Don't get me wrong. But everybody's like, let's do this. But then I looked at this like group that bought his music and what they do to people's lives, poor people's lives in housing and things like that. I'm going like, and I'm going, and then I saw other people doing it, talking about it. And they're all like all in that, like doing deals with Amazon and things like that. I'm like, Amazon like doesn't let, doesn't have workers. And I'm like, we're all trying to be like, look at me, I'm right. You know, I'm, I'm excluding this person so you can, because you can look at me and, and, and think well of me. But the fact is, if you look into that person who's practicing the exclusion, you're going to find out that they're not perfect either. And that's why the Bible says we all fall short of God's glorious standard, but yet God in his gracious kindness declares us not guilty. This is why Paul is saying there's neither Jew nor Gentile, free or slave, you know, um, because he's saying none of these people are, we're, we're all human. We're all haphazardly human, just like Jay Baker. So it's something to think about because we've been caught up in this black and white thinking. And maybe that comes from maybe too many movies or you know, too many books that are fiction or things like that, where we just want the hero and all that, you know, to ride in on the, the white horse and save the day. But that's just not how, you know, the world works. Um,
But I, I think that's also why people like Batman and like, you know, diehards and things like that. They like the flawed hero. But th that's the point is that people are flawed. They're not perfect. Their lives aren't together. And there's real pain and real contradiction there. And when we're able to realize our own contradictions in our lives, I think we're able to reach out and show more grace to the other people who might be showing contradiction or doing things that we disagree with. So, you know, I think about that song, the Depeche Mode song, people are people, so why should it be? You and I should get along so awfully, boom, boom, boom. And yeah, it takes another man to make me hate a man. <laughs> um, so anyway, sorry, I'm, I, no, I'm not sorry. That's, that's where this talk's going today. But he, so he's saying they want to exclude you so that you may think much of them. And then he says, is it good to be made much of for a good purpose all the time and not only when I'm present with you? My little children for whom I am again in this pain of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I were present with you now and could change my tone for I am perplexed about you. And I, I love this point is that he's saying like, I don't want to be this harsh, but I can't be there. And I'm going to send you this letter and it's going to be a bit harsh, but it's not, I don't want to be this way, but it's because it's, this is the how I have to talk to you. I am not able to be there with you. I wish I could be there with you and help you realize like the importance of this. And when he says, I wish Christ could be fulfilled in you. And when he's saying what happens when Christ is fulfilled in us is that we're not, Virtue signaling to one another about how great we are to make somebody else feel less. There's no hierarchy. There's no lowerarchy. It's actually a very communist idea and not like perverse communism, obviously. But this very idea of like people are equal. It's very socialist. I, I'm sorry that those are all bad words in America, but those are, these are the concepts here that's happening. You know, your community. I mean, this is radical stuff. But he does say it's good to be made good of for good purposes. You know, so, so like Dr. King, yeah, Dr. King deserves a statue. Was Dr. King have issues and with things? Was he a perfect human being? No way. But it's good that we remember the good things that this human being has done and that the fact is, is that we don't forget that he's a human being. You know, the FBI are going to be releasing tapes, I think, in the next two or three years from some really bad things that happened with Dr. King. And people are probably going to really throw him under the bus. Um, or a lot of people will be like, see, we told you so, you know, that type of thing. But the fact is, is that all it does for me is it reminds us that we're all human. We all fall short. And if we want to find a common ground, it's like the 12 steps. You're finding common ground in an addiction, in something that people think is a really bad thing. And it is. It's something that's leading most people there to death. And how do they become a community? And how do they become a, a group that's really looked upon? I mean, some people get freaked out by AA. I, I, you know, um, I get it. But it, it's really, I don't get it all that much once you, if you find the right group. Um, but, or by the 12-step programs. I'm not supposed to talk about one particular 12-step program. Or anonymous, you know, um, but but it's coming together over. We're all humans. We're all alcoholics here. It doesn't matter if you're Republican. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat. It doesn't matter if you're a conservative Christian, and you know, like completely conservative, and, and then trans. I mean, you'll see conservative Christians sponsoring transgender folks, and transgender folks sponsoring, and just trying to keep each other alive. I mean, you'll see it all the time in, in those programs and um, in the program. And, and to me, that's very interesting because it's, there's this fault there and this fault that is very dangerous to us that will devastate us is the thing that's uniting us together as a community. That one thing that rises above all the cool stuff, all the politics, all the standards, all the upbringing, all every, it's just, 
all has to be put aside because we are trying to stay alive. And I think if we took seriousness, how community keeps us alive and keeps us healthy in a different way, we might try to be like, all right, we all got to come together because we're all, we're all human. We all have uh, the dialectic. You know, the dialectic is, a, you know, there's the, 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 the dialectic, the two opposites, you know, we have to coming together. We, we need that. I think that's why dialectic therapy helped me, uh, dialectic behavior therapy helped me so much. Um, the, the, the contradiction and the compromise. Um, it's amazing what you'll do to help other people stay alive and keep yourself alive as well. And um, could you imagine if we had that type of passion for our faith and for our religion and for the Christ following Christianity, if we want to follow Christianity. Um, just to quote what, you know, Steve uh, Peters, my good buddy here, said, God's grace is made perfect in our weakness. And it's true. Um, when I'm weak, he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. <laughs> um, but also the fact of like, I, I think about like, you know, we all want to, you know, people had this great image of God during the crucifixion, you know, and, and you had the Holy of Holies, okay? And, and Jesus dying on a cross going, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? You know, all this, God feels abandoned by God and, and then this curtain, you know, Jesus dies and this curtain rips apart of the Holy of Holies, kind of where the God spirit was, the God dust or the God cloud or whatever supposedly is. You know, the, everybody's face is going to melt if, they, if it opens. Splits down and there's nothing behind it. But you know what is there? A dead man, a dead human being on a cross. That's God. There's your God. The dead man on the cross whose last words forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. You know, it's a harsh reality. It's a harsh reality of humanity. You know, it, there's nothing, the curtain's ripped, there's nothing behind it. There's no... Here's your God. That suffered and died. And said so they don't even know what they're doing. And so what I'm trying to do is help us figure out what we're doing and how to do it better. And that's what I believe revolution is here for. And that's what I believe you guys are here for. Uh, Paul goes into this. And now this is where I think it gets kind of mind-blowing in Galatians. He um, goes, tell me, you who desire to be subject to the law, will you not listen to the law? This is cool. Paul turns it again over, over here to the to the group that's you know James's group, the Judaizers or a group who are kind of like Ugh. you got to remember. I bet you there was a few little small people who were still keeping the community there though. I bet you they were like, Paul's right, you know. And I was like, oh, Paul better not be talking about me, because um, you know there's always a few good eggs. Um, tell me, you who deserve to be subject to the law, will you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. One, the child of the slave, was born according to the flesh. The other child of the free woman was born through the promise. Now, if you know this, Abraham like, was promised that he would have a child and have descendants, and that's how he was made. That's when grace first came. That's when faith first came. That's father of faith right there, boom. He was made well for his faith, not by works. But the interesting thing is, is like, because he believed that he would have all these descendants with Sarah. But the next thing he does is he doubts it, and then he goes and sleeps with somebody else. He's like, well, she's younger, so she could probably have more kids, so I'll just do it my way. And I think that's interesting because it shows the humanity of Abraham, even. Like, like you're made right by faith because you believed, even though a few seconds later you decided to try it another way as well. That's very interesting, and I think it's something for us to realize when, when, when it says all fall short, you know, Abraham wasn't just like, yes, and I'll go have sex with Sarah and we'll have millions of children. You know, he's like thinking like, oh, you know, I might know how to do this a little bit better. You know, how often do we do that? I mean, almost every church I've ever been thinks they found a better way or a new law that we've put into to, to line. Um, 
Okay, according to the flesh, the other, the child of the free woman, was born through the promise. Now listen to this. Paul says this very clear. He goes, now this is an allegory. So listen, he says, this is an allegory. If you need to find out what an allegory is, go look it up on Google. But this is an allegory. These women are two covenants. Okay, he's explaining to what an allegory is, what it means. One woman, in fact, is his... Uh, one, one woman, in fact, is Hagar from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. Now, Hagar in Mount Sinai is Arabia. And corresponding to the present Jerusalem, corresponding to the present Jerusalem, she is the slave, she is slavery with her children. But the other woman corresponding to Jerusalem above, she is free and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, you children, one who bear no children, burst into song and shout, you who endure no birth pains, for the child of the dissolute women are many numbers than the children of the one who is married. Now you, my friends, are children of the promise, like Isaac. But just at the time for a child who was born according to the flesh, persecuted of the child who was born according to the spirit. So now also, but what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her child. For the child of the slave will not share in the inheritance with the child of the free woman. So then friends, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Now, why is this interesting? I'm about to tell you, it's about to get really mind boggling. But do you see what Paul's mind, mind boggling switcheroo he does here? Um, he includes the Gentiles in with the Jews and says, we're all children of the free woman. Much like Jesus said, you've heard that said in the law, this, but I say this. Um, because he's saying the slave, when you go back to the law, you are slaves. So when you go back to the law, you're acting as slaves. When you leave the law, when you're free from the law, you are with children of the free woman. And that's pretty mind boggling. I never saw that before. In, 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 in Galatians, um, how, how impactful that really is of, of that he's saying literally the only way to be children of the slave woman now is to be under the law. It's not to be the chosen people anymore and, and, and the Gentiles anymore, but it's to be under the law and now you're slave. So... Yeah, I'll try to speak on it a little bit more here because um, this is the end anyway. But I'll, I'll read a little bit of, of uh, five one, so you can get a little bit more of that. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. You know, he is saying Christ has made us all the free children. Um. And so this is one of those things where probably people were having a hard time with Paul too, is that he's coming in and saying, he, that, I think this is also why he led with there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free male or female. I, I, I think is what he was, he was just about to hit him with this. And that's what Paul does is he, he says something radical and then he goes in and then he tries to explain it. Like, you know, when he says, yeah, and they turned on each other, you know, they turned and lusted for each other and blah, blah, blah. And then he goes, what horrible people and, in Romans 2, what I'm talking about, you say, but you're just as bad for judging these people. You know, you're like, well, switch a brew. You know, um, it's kind of Paul's style of writing. Um, he's the M. Night Shyamalan of the Bible. Um, and so here he's, he, 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 he's saying like, when he, when he says drive, <laughs> drive out the slave woman, he's saying when we rebuild the old system, and he said this earlier, and when you rebuild the old system, I only become a slave to Lot when I rebuild the old system. I only become guilty when I rebuild the old system that was torn down. 
And so he's saying, this is what Christ has done. This is why I'm saying Christ became clear to me through Paul, is he's saying this is the message of Christ, is that we're all human beings. There literally is no Jew nor Gentile anymore. And when we realize this, we are free. When we realize the humanity of others and our own humanity, we are free. We are not slaves. When we are under the law, and we'll talk a little bit more about this probably next week about exactly, like, let's look at a little bit more of what the law meant to people and what the law could, can represent. Um, but I think a lot of us see it, what, what's going on here with, with these, you know, it's, it's dividing this community because one community says we have to go by the law and, and Paul's saying the law is dead. But what Paul is trying to, I think, show in a very hard way, and I think that's why he goes, I wish I could speak to you guys a little bit kinder and I wish I could be there is because he's about to go into this. You know, he's about to go in and say, listen, if you guys want to go back to the law, um, you know, you, you, are, you, are, you, you, are bec you are no longer the free children. You are, um, like, I give you two, two covenants. One woman, in fact, is Hagar from Mount Sinai. I have children for slave. You, he's basically saying when you rebuild the law, you're, you're the children of Hagar. Because now you're slaves to the law. And, um, and he's saying that that's not what we're, this isn't what we're here to do. And what does it say? It says, cast them out. You know, he's saying, like, if you want to follow Christianity, it, what Jesus has done into both uh, at, to, uh, to fulfill the covenant in Judaism and what Jesus has done for the Gentiles has made us all free and has changed the game completely just as Jesus was changing the law, just as when Jesus would read the scriptures and leave out certain parts. You know, Jesus is, it's like when the Joker is, uh, Heath Ledger's Joker is talking to Batman and he goes, you've changed things. You've made things different. You've done, you've changed things. And what he's saying is Jesus has changed things. And he said, and I've changed things because I'm building on that covenant of Christ and, and but now I'm called to reach Gentiles. So the, so when Jesus said, you'll do greater things than I, he's saying that's what he's talking about is now I'm reaching the Gentiles. I'm doing, the inclusion is, 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 is evolving through this faith, through this message. This is the good news. Don't be bound up to slavery. Don't become children of the slave woman because now it doesn't matter where you were born. Remember when, 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 when Jesus met the woman at the well? And she goes, yes, we say we, can, we pray and worship here. And you say, it's, and Jesus goes, a time is coming where it will not matter where you worship. And this was huge change. And for me, the hard part of this is, <clears throat> is we don't, we look at the time we live in now and think this is the tough time and those are really the bad people, and these are really the good people, and now it's clear to us. But this is exactly how these folks felt in this community. The Judaizers felt like these folks are not following through everything we've done with our whole life, our whole customs. Christ comes through us. How dare they? And, you know, the Gauls are saying, like, everything you've told us about Christ, we've believed and accepted, and now you're trying to add things that we're supposed to do, often like you hear at church after you hear the every hand, every eye closed and every head bowed, uh, you know, thing, secret prayer of like, it's free. It's all you got. Now you've got to go pay for it. Um, we're going to talk about that in a couple months as well. But, um, but, but this, the, you know, it, you know, he's trying to see you guys, you know, so everybody's like, oh, you know, and this is their lives. This is their identities. And he's taking away their identities. He's taking away these communities and what do we still continue to do in the church is go, oh, well, God must be a Republican. Or then we go over, oh, no, God was definitely, Jesus would definitely be a socialist Democrat. No, Jesus, you know, so we go decide to give Jesus and create God in our own image, as we do. Um, you know, God created us in his, Im our, in his image, and then we return the favor. Um, you see what I'm saying, though? Like, we're, we're, well, Jay, you know, it's, it's different, you know, because, you know, the vaccine, it's different with the vaccine because it's putting people in danger and blah, blah, blah. 
You don't think these people felt like the other was putting each other at danger? You don't think that these people were thought that everything that they lived for and believed for was being questioned? You don't think this was a hard thing to do? You don't feel like they were felt like their humanity and their identity was being not, un, not recognized? I mean, he is asking so much of this community. And this is what I'm going to say, and I'm going to get into preacher mode here. I'm going to actually get in a little bit of a Jim Baker mode here for a second, not 80s Jim Baker. Um, <laughs> and I'll point like he used to. <laughs> um, this is the hard work. This is what, we, if we decide to say, I, I want to go into Christianity, I want to follow Christianity, you know, this is something I'm into, even if you're like uh, a Christian atheist, ag Christian agnostic, Christian whatever, Christian plus, Christian minus, whatever, if this is, if this is the way, uh, uh, you know, this is the way, um, as the Mandalorian says, um, this is the way. Community not scapegoating each other, giving up each other's identities, having tough conversations. Um, seeing a bigger picture and uh, judging each other by the contact of our character, you know, um, and still when the content, the character doesn't add up, we still are there to restore each other and, and, and not, you know, love your enemies and love your neighbor. I mean, this is what it's about. And it's really tough stuff to take, but this is what it's about. And it's just sad to me that we've allowed politics and our identity, or you could even say identity politics, to continue to divide us and separate us. And... Once again, I will say, like, if, if Jesus isn't a good enough example for you, you know, look at Gandhi or look at Martin Luther King who are willing to stand and talk and even be beaten um, by people who did not recognize their identity so their identity would be recognized. They forced them to recognize their identity. They forced them to see the blood come from their forehead. They forced them to see the humanity. And the world was watching and it forced the world to see the humanity. Um, not everybody sees it. Some people are blind and, and, and choose not to. But that's up for us to help those people who were blind see. Do you see? Does that make more sense now? It says they were blind, but now they see. I mean, it makes a little more sense. It's not, it's not physically blind and we're going to go around and heal people and, and, and put spit and mud in their eyes and make them actually see. I mean, maybe you, if you can do that, that's great. Um, I would definitely do go around doing that if I could. Um, but right now, as we're saying, really see. Really see each other. Really see the world. So when you see a group being misused uh, or something like that law in, in Florida, the, the, you know, don't say the gay bill and all that stuff, you go, well, I have to stand up for this because these are my fellow human beings and, and we need to be treated equally. You can't say this. This wouldn't be fair. Would you say, oh, you can't say... Uh, Republican, or you can't say Democrat, or you can't say tattooed, or you can't say Christian, or you can't say Muslim, or you can't, you know what I mean? We have to defend each other. If we see our Muslim brothers and sisters being treated differently, we should say something. At the same time, I don't think there's anything wrong with us sitting down with our Muslim brothers and sisters and disagreeing well on theology. We have separate, we have different theologies, we have different ideas, you know? It's, you know, we get to the point where we become this way and we just treat each other very special and with kid gloves and, you know. But we're called to live in a uniqueness in a community that does not bite and devour one another, does not go to war with one another, but is willing to have conflict and willing to live life on life's terms. So I, I really believe that. Um, It's not an easy road, and, and you know what? It doesn't, and nothing is expected overnight. Uh, you know, I'm going to recommend you guys read on, You Are Accepted um, by Paul Tillich. Just Google You Are Accepted, Paul Tillich, and read that because I think that's a good place to go if this type of thing makes you feel overwhelmed because you are accepted. I'm not saying you have to do any of this to be accepted, but what I'm saying is, is 
when the Bible talks about like you milk or, or Paul says, I'm gonna have to keep talking to you Christ until Christ is fulfilled in you completely. And when you go from milk to, to meat, you know, and, and you have to learn to eat like an adult, things get a little bit deeper, things get a little bit harder. And for one of the first times in my life, maybe not the very first time, but a long time, it's a hard road. Yes, uh, Zoe's right, it's a very hard road. Um, you know, uh, what James said, and now I, I think I'm starting to disagree with Martin Luther, the reformist, a little bit, is maybe James does belong here, because when James says faith without works is dead, it, it is. It, it might not be dead to the individual, okay? Um, Faith of you know, but it's dead to others. Your faith does not reproduce. Uh, the good news does not reproduce uh, without us making the hard decisions to argue well and to be in community and, and have differences. Um, but it's tough, and that's why we do it in community. Because honestly, I can't do it all. You know, uh, I had somebody send me a letter yesterday, like, "Oh, you wouldn't respond to me if I had, you know, if my pinky was on fire." So something strange like that. And it wasn't that I, I didn't want to respond. It's just like, man, I get a, so much from people that I can't respond to everybody. I, I would like to, you know. Um, but that's why we have community. And that's like, I'm not higher than anybody else. You know, that's why I, I don't like the, the, the pastoral epistles because it undoes, it undoes so much of the work that's done in this book. So if you go, Jay, why do you have, not just because it's been like historians don't believe it, and most theologians don't believe that, you know, ha will make excuses why they're there, but they will call them reactionary Paul. But the big for thing for me is that it's, it, it, it tries to undo the work that Paul is working so damn hard on here in Galatians to bring this community together and to see one another as human. So the road less traveled, the narrow road. This is the narrow road, folks. Um, so love your neighbor, love your enemy. Republicans and Democrats holding hands, <laughs> singing Kumbaya and Amazing Grace. Um, I mean, ironically, Amazing Grace, you know, written by a slave owner. So you do the math there, folks. It's, it's, uh... anyway, that's it. That's all I got to you guys today. I, I was surprised that so much would come out of four. Um, so four is no longer a bore. Um, we'll go through this together. You know, and what's funny thing is, is how much I learn from you folks. Um, cause I'll get messages from some of you folks telling me things you're doing. And it's like seeing all this come true. And it's like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm rolling these around. I'm an overthinker and I'm, I'm studying theology and studying philosophy and doing everything I can to bring this message out. But then I see you guys doing it and it, it makes me realize, that, you know, I'm not just here with hypotheses. Because um, honestly, right now, I don't have a, a community in this city. So um, it's really great to see. And... Uh, I'm grateful for you all because it allows me, to, you, you show me that this is not just wishful thinking, that this is really good news that works and we can actually put our feet on the street and do it. So um, thank you all very much. I love you so much. If you appreciate our work, please go to revolutionchurch.com and uh, maybe consider supporting us, sending us a few dollars. Uh, so we can continue to do this and continue to grow and try to do more things. Um, seems like a, we take two steps forward and then three steps back, but we're going to keep moving forward. And uh, if you can support what we do, we're grateful for that. And uh, it does make it possible. We're, we run on a very small budget, I promise you. And uh, so any amount really does help. Lots of love, lots of grace. Um, see you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. 
To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website.